Howdy, howdy. How's everyone doing? We're we doing good. Were you asking the listeners? <clears throat> you know, sometimes I'd like to think I'm live when I do this show and it helps. Well, no, I was just curious. I didn't know if you were talking to the room or the listeners. It's... I was just putting it out there in the universe. Right. You know how it goes? Right, yeah, yeah. Being someone who's live in radio, that's what I do on the weekends. That's what I'm used to. This podcast, it's just, you know, a shell of what this can be. And what this is now, though, is the Center Ring, your favorite esports podcast. Is it because there's only like four of them? Maybe. But we're not going to look at that. <clears throat> TCR for short. Our website, tcr.gg. Check it out. You have all the past shows, uh, YouTube links, every link's there. But we are the Center Ring. This is episode 20. Two, coming at you live, pre-recorded from an undisclosed location. The date, March 1st, 2016, a little past 9.30 p.m. Central Standard Time. My name is Tim. The gentleman you heard earlier, he is Brandon. Brandon, how are you today? Good. We're starting a little bit late today, but it, we're starting it was, late. It was because of that awesome late. show prep that we just put in. Um, I've noticed prior to us actually trying to set a schedule, we actually showed up here every Monday around eight o'clock and did the show. Then we set the schedule to get YouTube ready. And now it's like and now Wednesday. We, yeah, you know, let's do it tomorrow. You want to do it today? Well, you know, traffic's going to be bad downtown near the station. So let's not do it then. And because we are right next door to a stadium. So it just sucks to anytime there's a game to fight that traffic. It's like, yeah. you know, I don't get paid for this yet. Yeah. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's move it till tomorrow. Yeah. No one's going to no one. And you know what? No one ever messages us saying, hey, where's uh, where's episode 22? So not like it matters at all when we do this. Yep. No one cares when we record. But nonetheless, we are here, and it's not going to damper the show at all. In fact, this is probably the best episode yet. Episode 22. We will always end with the micro, a series of some stories that just did not have the meat on the bone to discuss. Uh, we will also bring up Dota 2 Shanghai, the the horror stories that are coming from the the pool play, the first week of that Dota 2 major that everyone was so amped up for, and and where is it going, and why the gameplay is actually not the main story there. Uh, we want to dive in a little bit to Visa talk, and don't tune out the second you hear that, because... In esports, there's a lot of uh, international play, if you will, to say the least. Lots of traveling, meaning lots of passports, lots of visas needs to uh, they need to get approved. And uh, we had a little controversy in the last couple of weeks on that, so we wanted to kind of look at that, look at it from a um, I don't know if you want to say devil's advocate. I don't. Yeah, that was really your research project. It's Is not. It? It's not devil's advocate. It's it's looking at it from a research standpoint. I mean, looking at the numbers. Yeah, it's that's what we are doing. Completely objective look at it. Yeah. Okay, and that's what we do best here, at TCR, is objective look. Uh, but to start the show, I want to start with M the MLG qualifiers for the MLG major that's happening uh, here in about four ish weeks. Actually, it's fastly approaching. Yeah, I actually got the, the email about our flights being around the corner. So the bags are packed. You know, I have an email from DreamHack that we have our tickets and I need to print those out because Lord knows I'm probably going to F that one up. So it's right around the corner. You had the qualifier this weekend. Good luck Googling anything on it because there are no really articles on it. It's like it happened and forgotten. I, I, I don't know what why the lack of love for the, the MLG qualifier? I, I tweeted at the score esports this morning because I was like, oh, I'm going to read some of the articles I've got up. We're going to talk about it on the show tonight. And uh, they were a major sponsor for it all over the desk and everything. And n nothing. They 
have the last story was Splice replacing one of the teams. They're already all they've already moved on to IEM. Which to be fair, it, it is a that's an actual tournament with a prize pool. So I mean, I guess priorities, but at the same time, if you pride yourself as being news outlets, and I'm not just talking about the score, anybody out there, yeah. how MLG's own website doesn't even have anything on there. Yeah. It still says qualified teams and it shows like the normal eight that were there and then the you know, top eight for qualifier. It's ridiculous, but I don't want to get bogged down on that because it actually was an amazing weekend of Counter-Strike Go action. Um, I don't know how you want to break this down between groups, between what comes to mind, because Group A, I guess let's start with Group A because I this is one thing that came to mind. So G2 and Flipside qualified from Group A. That wouldn't have been a surprise if Tempo Storm didn't look so strong in the previous weeks or the prior weeks coming to this tournament. But Flipside actually did end up beating Tempo Storm in a, a best of two, fair and square. Or I'm sorry, they beat them two in a best of three. I guess a best of two would just be a <laughs> single a, elimination. A but <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so Tempo Storm is actually not going to be at MLG Somewhat of a surprise, just given their track record as of late. Yeah, when they rolled through that qualifier, um, to you actually think the confidence the, was high. The, either they rolled through the qualifier for the qualifier, um, and then come in and put up thirteen rounds against G two, which you know that's, I'd say it's a sol- it's a solid performance. It's uh, that's still you know the G two lineup that has a decent reputation behind them with you know um, X Titan, um. Absolutely rolled over um, selfless gaming sixteen to four. Completely understandable. That's what you should do. And then they didn't manage to take a, a map against Flipside, which was kind of. I mean, that was the game that mattered, and it, it was kind of a letdown after strong performances throughout the rest of the the tournament. And it's weird that they would play better against. Well, maybe it's not. It's because they played better against G two, a team that they kind of knew who they were going in. Where Flipside's been such an off and on team, like for the last year, Flipside has been an off and on team where you can't, like you wouldn't want to put your skins on the line on Flipside because you just don't know what type of game you're going to get. They chose a good time to to perform, to say the least. Uh, but it is a shame to see Tempo Storm go. I think. Yeah, um, uh, it's another Brazilian team. Like I said, I mean, Brazilian's the NA hope, right? But uh, I'm not a huge fan of the Brazilian mentality when it comes to their interactions with the rest of the players and other stuff. It's very much like a us versus them, versus them being the rest of the world. And I, I mean, I can understand, but it seems like the only person that has a person, or like the only player in that uh, community that has a personality has fallen. Yeah, I wasn't going to say it, but yes, I'm just not a huge <laughs> fan of the teams either, so... Mainly for personal reasons of I don't like the way they handle their business. Uh, moving on, though, to Group B. So that is a, a group where my attention was very strong on uh, for many reasons. Um, first off, you have Mouse Sports, Liquid, Hellraisers, and Team YP. I was very interested to see Team YP, not only because they're their media relations team manager lady, Claire, is an angel, <laughs> and she will answer your emails back very quickly. But they had visa issues. They actually had two guys not being able to make the tournament, so they had to get some sub-ins and last-minute adjustments for their team to be here. And I think it, it would have been awesome to see them. I don't think, even if they had their full roster, they didn't pick up a single game here. And in fact, their round of differential was the worst at this entire tournament with a minus 29 round differential so they they won two, i don't think replacing two people is going to change that no, they won three three rounds total um throughout the entire tournament and yeah i don't think i granted um one of those players that had to sit down was uh, or wasn't able to make it was considered one of their best players but yeah, what are you, I mean, what are they going to do? Pick up another two rounds? 
I mean, when you have guys like Mouse Sports, which is, you know, Germany's pride and joy, I think they were going to go in. Liquid and Hellraisers, I felt like, to me, I actually like Mouse Sports. I'm very confident in their ability. Liquid and Hellraisers were, was kind of that flip option. Obviously, I picked Liquid being the homer that I am. And the fact that after talking to GB James, it just gets you hyped and, it, you know, you yeah. get bought in to the theory and to the philosophy of the way he coaches the team. But watching Liquid perform throughout this entire weekend was absolutely amazing. Like, this is only a qualifier. I get that this is a qualifier to get them to the tournament. So, I mean, they're they're nowhere near where they want to be. Obviously, this is a step in the right direction, but at the end of the day, this got them into a tournament where they probably would have liked to just not even have played in the qualifier to get right. into and just gotten the invite. Getting invited, yeah. So, and that's one thing that you need to bring up, the fact that like all of NA's top teams were in this qualifier and none <laughs> really were able to skip it and be just invited. So that's one thing that I felt like kind of got lost on the weekend other than just being a punching bag of NA jokes from every other commentator out there. So, but let's not respect the tournament or anything. Uh, Liquid, getting back on there. They ended up, who who was their best of three against? Hellraisers. Right, so they, they played Hellraisers twice. The first match they played in the best of one, it went to overtime against Hellraisers, which uh, they ended up, Hellraisers ended up winning 22 to 20. Then they played the best of three against Hellraisers, um, which had the final game that was the epic comeback from 13 and 7. Six, I believe. Six? I believe it was 13 six? at 6. I don't have the numbers in front of me. I believe it was 13 at 6. And I remember because I was texting, me and my buddies were all texting each other saying like, well, is this really how it's going to end? Like, is this seriously how it's going to end? And then when they get to like 11, you know, everyone's kind of joking about like, oh, here's the comeback. And then all of a sudden they come back and everybody freaks out. I mean, but it wasn't just so much the comeback, but it was like you said, it was like in mid game, they took that time out and it was a completely different team afterwards. Yes, it was. uh, I I rewatched or watched the VOD today this this morning and that timeout happened and then after that timeout, it was like everybody on Team Liquid decided that they were going to clutch around or that they were just going to go ham. I mean, Elise, Elise was mowing people down on Catwalk uh, on Dust 2 on that, that game like it was nobody's business. There, I say, Adrin really stepped up uh, in the in that, that best of three with the op. Well, and then, uh, so this Adren situation, remember, listeners... That Adren, this is like his final swan song with Team Liquid because Kusta is actually on Team Liquid now on a permanent spot. Yeah, so, so now that they've Ad- qualified for it, they have to play with Adren, with at, Adren the major. at the major. Which I'm happy for because in my dreamland situation that's finally happening, they asked the ex-girlfriend <laughs> to go to prom with them because they don't want to be dateless. Yeah, and it's actually working out to where the ex girlfriend doesn't look that bad anymore, and Adren might have a job after this. Yeah. yeah, so it's either a team's gonna pick up Adren, Cloud Nine, or they're gonna have a really awkward situation of like so Kusta about that contract. I know you you kind of like did enemy dirty, but if you could just you know not join the team. How about you'd be a sub? And that's my dream scenario there where Adren gets back onto Team Liquid just from his pure performance and, for the qualifier and major. And you know, and not just Adren though, props need to go to Hiko too who went totally ham this entire tournament. He he really proved um a couple detractors that said he might have been losing a step. Well, wrong. I think the that and that's kind of the funny thing is that this is the tournament that everybody was waiting for for Team Liquid, where you see that light bulb go off, the mature point happen, where everybody's all of a sudden like something felt different watching them. Like you said, like Nitro, there was a mixture of 
in-game leadership going on throughout the whole weekend with them where like sometimes Nitro was doing it and then you would, you know, yep. he would pass it over to Adren and it was more, I think, like a, a teamwork kind of deal of, hey, what do you think the best strats are? I think that was more or less what it was is Nitro opened up and I think we get caught up on like the, the roles and everything in Counter-Strike. It's not like a normal position sport where a lineman just cannot be a quarterback not not well, that will never happen where a lineman just is a quarterback for a day that's right but yeah. in counter-strike or in esports well it, it's specifically with counter-strike because in mobas you have like heroes and yeah a healer is going to be a healer but in counter-strike you an in-game leader that can be any role that's what a- what is it dictating that one person is to call all the shots why can't it be a dictatorship for a team you know and and uh, there there was a particular round in that hellraisers liquid game uh that uh forgive me one of the liquid players got a kill with a nade so he had um a few extra dollars and they were able to afford one rifle and everyone knows on team liquid he goes the lurker he's the guy that's finishing kills does the clutches that's his deal but you also have simple on this team now who is I would say a world renowned, you know, rifler in his own right. And when they managed to purchase a single rifle, they gave it to simple. And, you know, he switched into that lurker role for that particular, you know, game and round to, to kind of give them the edge in in that department. That just kind of shows the fluidity of the positions in counter-strike. And I think that was what I saw while playing is that everybody was finally opening up to everybody else's ideas and roles and thinking, okay, I, I don't have to be here. I don't have to call the shots. We can all five work together on this. And I think just watching, go back and watch the VOD. And I, you can almost see in that timeout. That's what clicked. Yep. So I think it was just a, a a full on wave of understanding of, just completely buying into the system. So it's, it's a shame thinking that this could be just like a, a swan song for this form of team liquid. It sucks to see him do so well and knowing that it's going to change. Right. And it's almost like, man, if it does do really well, do they have to change? Cause I know going in, like some people are like, well, are they even going to care? Is a dren going to care? This is a qualifier for a million dollar tournament. I think he's going to care. <laughs> like, yeah. not to mention, he still also needs his his career, so he can't just throw in the towel and purposely throw these games if he ever wants to get picked up again. That's not going to happen. So you had all that going on. Meanwhile, on the other side of the, the NA pillar, you have uh, Group D. That consisted of Dignitas, Renegades, Cloud9, and Gambit. Gambit was actually, they I believe they just started back in January. Don't know the exact date, but I believe it was started in January. They are basically the former Hellraisers roster. So for those who didn't know where this team Gambit came from that was actually playing really well, they ended up qualifying. Um, Cloud9 also ended up qualifying very very dramatic fashion if cloud nine can do in any other way um they ended up qualifying actually the only team to qualify with a negative round win loss <laughs> ratio they actually ended it with a minus two round differential so but it doesn't matter they qualified they got in there with stewie 2k with Freakazoid, with the gang there, there's still talks of where they just need more coaching. They need they need what happened to Liquid. They need to buy into the system because I still think watching them, I don't I don't know what it is. Just watching Cloud9, sometimes it looks like they become so unfocused, and if they're down, then it's really just a hodgepodge of everybody's shot calling and doing every like everyone's doing a little bit of the same strategy and then a little bit from this strategy and they're just not on the same page almost like they're giving up yeah well it's especially with the 
Sean Garris leaving. There's a lack of leadership in that uh, you have people kind of, uh, from what I've heard, there's different people calling at different times. And when you start separating the leadership like that, it kind of leads to, it kind of leads to like, a, you know, everyone to each their own kind of mentality, I think. And you'll see players doing things that are like, it would benefit them, but it won't necessarily benefit the team's round or what, what they need to be doing. And Renegades was also in this group. Uh, Renegades, the Australian team who moved to America to participate in more of these type of tournaments and everything there. Um, they ended up going one and two for the tournament. They did not end up qualifying. It was ended up getting so, I'm assuming, the backlash on Sponge was so much, he actually deleted his Twitter account. I read, after, yeah. after this qualifier sponge is no longer on twitter and he was actually very active on twitter so this is not like just this is was, not like yeah he was active so he is no longer on twitter he had such a poor performance at this tournament almost like world record of a bad performance for this type of a player that should not be doing this bad in fact every round they played three matches okay Three matches, one in group and then one in the, or, you know, best of three with Cloud9. He bottom fragged in all of them. Bottom fragged in every single match. In Cloud9 in their best of three, minus 20. Versus Gambit, minus 10. Dignitas, minus six. (laughs) I mean, awful. Awful, awful, awful. And I really, so, and I, Sponge gets a lot of, a lot of flack for the things he says. That's, that's his problem. He's very, he's very confident, almost to the point where it's delusional for the team's performance. Like other teams like Cloud9 and Liquid all say like, you know, we have things to work on, but we do believe that we're a top tier team, but we need to work on things. He's like, no, we, we are a top tier team and. We just it's, don't get the respect we deserve. Right. It's and, ridiculous that people think that we're not. And that's the thing. You're not going to, especially in esports. Like, I mean, that's not even going to fly in most markets, but you're going to, if you're going to sit there and tell esports fans that they're wrong and then prove them right, oh, you're going to hear it. And he heard it so much that he decided to deactivate his Twitter account. Go off the grid for now. I I wish I've actually reached out to Sponge before to come on the show a- after he made the comment of, you know, we're just as good as any other top NA team. We just don't get the respect. I reached out to him to come on the show and kind of say, you know, explain what you meant because I felt like people heard Cloud Nine sucks. We're better, but I think he probably meant something a little different. I never heard back from him. I would love for him to come on the show. And give more of a, you know, he has the time to to come on and talk. But I just think he's almost at this point, he's put his foot in his mouth way too many times to to really come back from this one. uh, And they've also been cutting players, so maybe he's maybe he's a little nervous. I don't. He's like, maybe I should keep my mouth shut before they're like, we'll we'll lay low and, and go from there. Uh, group C, you had actually two uh, North American teams qualify. Actually, in all this tournament, the only North American team that did not qualify for this uh, was Selfless, which that was like Kusta's team. I, it was basically like X Enemy. Yeah. Uh, so, and I think they were out of it. I think the fear that people were like, "Oh, Liquid's not going to care because it's not their roster." I think they were almost just like, "Let's get, let's get this over with and go home." But in Group C, you had CLG qualify, and you also had Splice qualify. The reason I put emphasis on Splice qualifying is because Splice was not actually supposed to be at this tournament a week prior to the tournament. So do you know, when did they get word? For those who don't know, Splice replaced Mongols, who was not able to make it because of visa issues, which we will discuss in the next segment. But when was Splice told that you will be competing on Friday? 
the I mean the news the news of Splice taking that spot came out. Pro, it looks like it came out about three days before the actual tournament took place. So I mean, if you give them four four days, probably tops. And then they found out that they were going to be competing in the in the tournament. And granted, they were probably in the weakest. I think the weakest group. That's fair to say. If they were in any other group, they might not have yeah, qualified. So, so, the, they won the group. Yeah, they, they won didn't the just group. qualify. They won two games and they were done. And and they actually they posted a, a a solid plus eleven you know round differential. Um, like I said, not against the best teams, but they clearly showed the ability to execute. They had some good strats going on. Who knows how much of it was you know the wild card effect like nobody really knows how to play splice because they never have i don't i don't think that was that big of a deal um and i'm really happy to see them go from not even participating to now they're gonna have their own stickers and i thought it was very awesome on their part too to where because they were getting for whatever reason splice was getting trash for taking the mongols spot people thought it was unfair that an american team got the spot when an asian team was the one who got the shaft well what did you want them to do be like no we can't well this is just wrong for us to take this spot to compete in this qualifying tournament yeah and 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 the fact that they did come out and prove that they deserved to be there like why would anyone have anything to say other than like you know good job and and if you even completely disregard the fact that it's an NA team. You're not going to get, I mean, <clears throat> the fact that they got invited four or five days before the major, you can't get a visa application. And we'll go into this later, a visa application for another, you know, oceanic team to come and play. I mean, it's not going to happen. So they ended up doing it. The one thing, if we ever get a chance to get their coach on the show, our schedules do not match up very well. I do want to ask him about keeping the consistency with the team. Cause one thing splice has always been is inconsistent in my eyes. And hopefully this is a trend of, I mean, awesome exposure for the, the organization and awesome exposure going into for the players and getting that experience. And I'm curious to see if this can have that consistency stick with them and move on. We're still four weeks away from the actual major that these teams qualified for. So that is a long, long time. I mean, we had Katowice this upcoming week, which is not a major this year. MLG actually took the spot of Katowice being the major. Everyone freak out. But it's still a, it's still a tournament that holds a lot of water. So I, th- it's going to be interesting to see how these teams aim up like will these eight teams that qualify be the first eight teams out of the major i sure hope not that's what i'm curious to see in a hope and dreams right here (laughs) right so speaking of hopes and dreams that were completely shattered the mongols which we just mentioned were not able to make it because of visa issues splice ended up taking their spot the mongols were not able to make the tournament in fact last episode i believe i said I believe it was last episode. We talked about how the Mongols were having visa issues. And I was like, I'd be surprised if they missed the tournament just because you don't hear it as much where teams have issues. They always have issues, but they never get completely denied. Well, I was wrong because I think it was like the next day, as always, the news broke that the Mongols are not making this tournament. MLG got involved. The they got a council person a from the city council, I think it was, or Senate or somebody from Columbus in their like government oh. department was yeah. even reaching out to the embassy and nothing, nothing was working. They tried to pull every string they could. And in the end, it still wasn't working because the Mongols could not convince the U S embassy that they were ever going to go home. Yeah, so they actually posted the um, rejection letter from the U.S. Uh, concerning their visa, and it got rejected under what is called a 214B. 
uh, which was the clarification that they had enough things where they're from in Mongolia. They have enough assets, people, jobs, whatever. It's what they call strong ties to Mongolia that if they are to be led into the U.S., that they will come back. So the the danger being that they get there and then they just stay illegally, stay in the U.S. Um, and never leave. So I did some digging and and, and found, um, like I said, what constitutes a strong tie. Anything from bank accounts, uh, family, and you can when you look at these things, you can kind of understand why a professional gaming team is going to have issues with this because they're usually on the younger side. You're not going to have your own house. You're not going to have, you know, a very large bank account. You're not going to have, you I may mean, not even have employment. You're, you're not going to have anything that makes you have to go back home. Yeah, you you are literally able to go anywhere you want. So, that, I mean, I can understand why the U.S. would deny it. Um, I also pulled up fiscal year 2015 U.S. visa applications and total... The U.S. process is 14,019,671 uh, visas, or they, they processed that many visas in fiscal year 2015. Uh, 10,891,000 10, of those were accepted. 3,128,000 and 500 and some change were denied. So I'm, this isn't something like... This isn't like a isn't rare the, thing. The, yeah, it's not a rare thing. 3 million people last year... We're told the same exact thing. Yeah, so it's... I hate that the U.S. is kind of getting... Um, They're getting the short end of it. And the worst part is, is like, it's not even... It's not even so much it's a, it's a visa thing with... Especially with, like, all the Syrian refugees and everything. I can only imagine right now that visa applications are through the roof uh, for refugees and stuff like that, that... Uh, in all honesty, probably don't plan to leave the U.S. So it's a really tumultuous time to kind of apply for the visa um, and try and get in on it. Uh, and I can tell you that, I, I mean, I understand that uh, visa applications are different because uh, Poland... Well, and that's, yeah, that's another thing that doesn't make the U.S. policy look as, you know, the poster boy for this is the Mongols did get accepted visas for Katowice from Poland. So it like a week later, now Poland's giving them their visas and everyone's again saying this is why North America which America, I don't know why people always throw Canada and Mexico into this. Sorry guys. But <laughs> America shouldn't have a a major because it's too difficult to get into the country. Again, a lot of people do get in the country, and a lot of people don't. I and I even tweeted this out. It definitely, I mean, no doubt that situation blows. You qualify, you do everything that you had to do to get to this point. And I know MLG even said, like, honestly, they just waited too long. It was they really left them, Mongols left themselves no time to fix this if this situation happened which which clearly states on the the refusal letter that that's not like permanent if you can provide more evidence you can reapply and you know it'll 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 work out but it was just they left themselves with such little wiggle room on this to where there just wasn't enough time to reapply and go through the hoops again and look it's it's government work you're going to have hoops it's going to suck but at the same time, people think like, oh, this is, this is why, you know, they're not taking esports serious and all this. And like acting like it's some personal attack on esports. Does it state anywhere in there that like they can get denied because of the reason they're coming into this country? Or is it just for it, reasons on why you would have to go back? It's just the only refusal they got was that they did not have strong enough ties in Mongolia to be accepted on so the visa. So it had nothing to do with, so you weren't really coming here for a serious opportunity. No. And, and um, <laughs> the visas, that the, the type of visas that they apply for, 
if they're applying for the same type of visas that, you know, a professional athlete would apply for, there's different levels of those visas. The top one being what is considered um, someone of an extra, uh, extraordinary ability who is described as someone like Wayne Gretzky or Ronaldo. That's the top level visa. And then it goes all the way down to this B2 visa, which is an amateur athlete um, that will receive no payment other than expenses to compete. And then the one step of that is um, players that will receive no salary other than prize money. So, I mean, that's kind of where they would apply. And I, I have to imagine, again, there's a pecking order with with, I mean, with the levels. There's absolutely going to be a and pecking and order. And they're one step above like a... You know, like a, a a high school basketball, or like you know, a traveling basketball team coming from China to I play mean, an ex- exhibition. Yeah, match. they're they're a club team. Yeah, they're a club team going to this tournament. So there's absolutely there has to be a pecking order involved when you think of the. I mean, how how many did you say applied last year again? Oh, uh, what was it? Uh, fourteen. Fourteen million? million. Yeah, fourteen million. So out of those fourteen million, there are going to be. As much as this sucks, but life isn't fair, there's going to be some people more important than other people who probably have more pressing matters to get into the country for. You know, an Olympic athlete coming in town probably is going to take priority over, you know, a a high school team or, in this case, an esports athlete. And and what's, uh, ooh, that's interesting. Um, Looking at the B2 visas, which is the level of that visa that I was telling you about that you you earn your prize money, um, it looks to be one of the few where there's 140,000 of those particular visas applied for, and more than half of those visas got denied. 77,000 of those visas got denied. So there's there's that's an even bigger chunk of people being told, no, you can't come in here for that. So, so that can, yeah, it's so, and that's what, Again, that's what they're going for. That's the type of visa. And that's not anything on their own fault. I mean, that's that's the type of visa. That's where esports is at right now. Now, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe you don't have this in front of you, but didn't France, they recognize esports as an official sport. So if the government recognizes it as something, not just a prize pool type of sport... Yeah. That that will yeah, obviously probably, help visa issues. I want to say it's four months ago. France um, passed legislation to recognize esports as an as an athletic, like an, an actual sport, so they can so go they can do these for type of those things. visas and it not be yeah a complete pain in the ass to try and get them as more or less quote unquote civilian. So I th- I I think that's I think that's going to be everywhere eventually. I honestly do. Uh, I think esports is becoming big enough. I think you're getting corporates into esports, which corporate drives tell you, money co- and money Coca-Cola, drives. If Coca Cola would have been like, "Hey, U.S., you need to let the Mongols in," they probably would have done it. It, it, it. And that's true, though. Commerce drives everything. Um, as dirty as it sounds, commerce drives everything, even even the government. So I think once esports gets recognized here as a professional sport uh then it might not be as difficult but i did just want to bring that up on the show with visas to kind of show people that it sucks what happened to the mongols but they weren't the first people to have their visa denied when they had to come here for something important and they're not going to be the last this is not it was not a a personal thing about oh they don't take esports serious and how how can they ruin these you know these guys dreams of of doing this don't they know that they're the first you know asian ocean atlantic team to do this and oceanic and oh man like no they don't know any of that because all they were looking at was why would these guys ever go home <laughs> and they couldn't even prove why would they go home Unfortunately, like, the U.S. Say, government doesn't say you take have like a an dog, I promise as, right. a, as a valid, you know. And they have these rules there for a reason, and that's because people didn't leave at yep. one point. So that that's, I hope we were able to shed some light as far as the numbers and how visas somewhat work in that sense. 
Um, but moving on to something that's actually having a bigger issue than the visas themselves, and that is Dota 2 Shanghai Major. The first week is actually over. The actual main event starts tomorrow, actually. Uh, that actually might be going on right now, depending on time zone difference. But during group play and pool play, it was, dare I say, a, a disaster. It was a shaky start for the English stream. To say the least. So basically, if you're unfamiliar with it, but I'm sure if you follow it, you you clearly know by now. You almost have to follow it to know why nothing is going on on the stream. But the production team, Perfect World. Well, I, really, how should I start this? So the production team, Perfect World, they're, they were doing a very, very shaky job on the English stream. The Russian stream, that kept it fine the whole way through. Other streams kept it through. It was the English stream that was having issues. Uh, some of the rumors behind you know, the curtain was it's because the director for it was Chinese. And so the director was speaking Chinese. And then to a translator who would translate his orders to the production crew who was English. So it was just literally lost in translation and by the time they figured out what he wanted it was too late to do anything about it like that you know this is basically live television you cannot have delays in communication it's it needs you know, to happen it now. needs to happen now um all that was in the background that that started from the start people could tell there were delays from the get-go there's shaky production from the get-go everything was very obvious in that front and a lot of people were saying that they shouldn't even hire them in the first place. Why don't you get an English crew for your English production team? I do not know. Flash, fast, fast forward <laughs> a couple days to day two. Too Good was being the host of this event. He was brought on to host the event. Day two, he was fired from the event, which caused a an uproar on reddit and again i say reddit because i was watching this and i'm not you know i don't i normally don't get into all the ins and outs of these types of tournaments as far as personality goes and history behind them and i don't have reddit up all the time but with these delays and craziness you have to go there to because they don't tell you anything on stream nothing oh, i mean absolutely you, not. you, you watch counter-strike they there is no information given to you on these streams on why all of a sudden this host is gone and why are there delays. Long story short, Lord Gaben put in the order to let him go to where Too Good is no longer allowed to host a Valve event. Uh, now, I know you were reading some of it here, but I do have some... Ex well, let's start with um, Gaben's comments on Reddit. So Gaben actually posted on Reddit. He says two things. James, we've had issues with James as at previous events, which that was a questionable thing prior to um, when they hired Too Good. A lot of people were, were like, well, why, you know, you guys don't like each other to begin with, so why do this? Uh, but uh, some people lobbed to bring him back in, Gaben says, for Shanghai, feeling that he deserved another chance. That was the mistake G Gaben puts bluntly. James is an ass and we won't be working with him again. That was number one. Number two, and this is where I was kind of talking to at the start of this. Um, as long as we're firing people, we're also firing the production company that we've been working with in Shanghai. And he was not like, I was like, okay, so they're what? Not going to hire him for like another event, right? They won't be back next time. No, no. Immediately. <laughs> Immediately. They fired the, the production team in mid-tournament. In the middle of a major tournament, we fired the, the host who is leading every conversation that doesn't involve the game, and the production company who is literally putting this on for everybody. Gabe just said, <laughs> we are done. So it was so bad, he didn't even want to think of how they were going to do it afterwards. He was like, we will deal with that later. We're done here with these guys. 
And it got to the point where I actually have some tweets here from uh, some well-known people. Toby one, he tweets out, um, Gabe has decreed that key TV has been fired, meaning the English stream has no production team slash panel raw streams only. So at this time I'm sitting in my bed with the stream on my TV and literally in between matches, there is nothing but like the splash screen for the Shanghai major. That is it. You have no idea when the next stream's going to be, when the next match is, who's going to be playing in that match. Nothing. That production team pieced out and they had nobody in there for a backup. So what ended up happening was all these like personalities that weren't invited to Shanghai basically got together in a chat room and they started doing like intermission shows on their own streams. So if you were an English, you know, viewer, that's what you had to do. You had to jump back and forth. So, and then they would let you know when the game start, but then you would jump over to the game stream and then jump back over to theirs and everything there. It was a mess. It was awful. Uh, which is a shame because normally Dota two majors are ran so smooth and this one was not that case. Uh, and then you even had uh, the capitalist said, uh, I believe the, that means we won't be doing any panels today, but only casting the game due to production limitations. So like all these guys who are there basically calling these games are like, we don't know what to do. Like we don't have, like when we say, like when you say you have no production, you think like, okay, so what? You don't have a director. Who cares? Just, no, they had... Yeah, you, you just got to move one camera, just cut to the other camera. No. They had uh -uh. nothing. Nada. So that, that was an issue in itself. I'm sure with the main event, everything's going to be fixed out. Maybe they just used that first week as kind of like a buffer week. But we're getting down into the, what I like to call the meat and potatoes of all this, and that is Two Goods comments. So you have some of his comments in front of you, don't you? Yeah, it's... Uh... Uh, he released a a very uh, long statement. So he he said he was going to release a statement. Decided against it per the statement that was later released. He decided against it, but after Gabe's um, post, he decided that he needed to, I guess, put his side of the story out. Um, and it's long. It's seventeen pages long. Uh, that starts all the way from when he was asked to do it. Uh, it has history about uh, when Gabe mentioned that um, they had worked with him before and didn't like it and that other people lobbied. So it goes back into the history of of him with, with Valve's tournaments. And there are several quotes throughout that kind of jumped out at me. Um, he maintains the position that he was told when he, when he was hired that he needed to be himself and just do whatever he does. He was under the impression that many of the segments that he had were going to be about 15 minutes long and they ended up taking an hour or more. Now in, in his defense too, because of those unexpected delays, like he, he prepped material for delays, but not for like an hour delay. So in his defense, I could see where things kind of got wheels off and they were doing things on the whiteboard and things like that. I understand that. So, and th and this is kind of where I, I end up getting, I divide myself um, from the rest of the esports community for my own stance on this, that if, if you're doing this as a job, then you need to, to do it like a job. I think we're and in the minority in that. And it's a, it's a, um, it's a weird dichotomy because these people don't work for the company specifically. They're like contractors. So they'll have a job for this tournament or that tournament or this tournament. So not only do they have a responsibility to the, the people that have hired them for the tournaments, but they also have responsibility to the people that follow them on all the social medias and all, and all of that. Um, he opens the very first segment with a joke about how porn was blocked in China and he was needed to watch porn for his 
first pre-panel ritual. And I actually have the audio for that. Would you like to listen to it? It's let's, about a let's minute. Hear it. It's about a minute long. No one asked, by the way, how the host is doing ever. That's Ask typical. Yourself. Let's see the host. Well, I'm doing okay. Yeah. I'm I'm glad you liked the intro. Um, I was a little bit worried that I would say something, you know, bad. Um, because um, uh, normally, you know, I have like a pre-hosting ritual um, winter. I mean, you can probably appreciate this. Um, so last night, you know, I was perusing the uh, hotel entertainment. And, um, you know, actually, you know, for the ritual to get ready for today. And um, it turned out, you know, censorship, the uh, Chinese hotel disab had disabled pornography. So it was very hard to kind of get ready for the show. <laughs> um, I mean, uh. I mean, don't get me wrong. I watched it. Mr. <laughs> Wang's amazing wheelchair antics were pretty amazing. Um, a real thriller, and I did manage to finish. And I, you know, I'm here for the show today now. So is, uh, this, the, is this the rehearsal, just, by the way? Like, <laughs> are, we, just, are we live? Or is this the... <laughs> it's just, you know. So I feel like I'm uh, ready to host. You know what I mean? Like nothing's gonna hold me back. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm here, ready for some Dota 2. We've got some great teams playing. All right, so he starts that. To be fair, it, it's it, not like that's a crazy, it's not, I wouldn't say it's offensive. That's not like some crazy off the wall thing. But if the expectations of your boss is that you're going to be PG and professional, then yeah, that's not the best thing to open up your your host to. Like that is the first thing you're going to say. And the worst in my opinion, as a host, you know, part of your job is to kind of create the atmosphere for the panelist and the analyst, you know, to, to do their job, which is to talk about the games. And I mean, just listening to the response, there's like a super awkward kind of like, I shouldn't laugh at this. What do I say in response to this kind of pause before he forced it to move on? And, um, he was told afterwards, uh, no more porn jokes. Uh, and apparently this came directly from Gabe. So the guy at Valve said, lay off the porn jokes. And his, his rationale on it was that uh, he had to do something like that because he hasn't hosted in a while and his fan base expects something along those lines from him. So I guess his fan base expects just kind of lowbrow kind of humor. Great. You got it off your chest. Your fan base is happy. Gabe told you don't do it again. Awesome. Don't do it again. Later on, <clears throat> he's hosting a segment that once again got extended 400% longer than it was supposed to be. An hour and a half from 15 or 20 minutes. Um, rolls this segment where they're joking around and at one point they're even playing tic-tac-toe on this whiteboard that apparently everyone hated or everyone in the production hated uh, that they were he was bringing down the production quality I guess for having a whiteboard I I, I saw That's, the, the rant whatever kind of made sense to me yeah I mean he was doing stuff with it at least it wasn't just like <laughs> he had an hour and pictures. a half to yeah. kill of delays like I'm surprised he didn't bring out sock puppets so uh, during this long delay he makes a joke about um, seeing calling them one of them a bottom bitch from for directly from the quote and this is what got him fired when he said that uh, and, and he said, again, he had a rationale of uh, it, they're personal friends of his. Uh, they've both contacted him for support. And so for him, it wasn't out of place to make the joke. Now, isn't that one of the issues, though, is that he can't set like and well, he, he even goes into saying how uh, he actually mentioned at one point, And this is what really threw me off is that he's you know he states that you know i'm angry that we're pretending and this is all you know loosely quoted i'm angry that we're pretending to be sports when we're not sports we're esports this is what we've been doing for years entertain the viewers no matter what no matter the problems we entertain the viewers and do what we have to do to keep them entertained 
my my thing is is it doesn't have to be you know comedy hour at the improv every every intermission let the actual game do the entertainment you host you analyze we will move on say a cheeky joke if you have to that's fine but we live in a pc world now where if your boss man told you not to make porn jokes calling someone a bottom bitch probably will uh set him off on that so he ends up getting fired and he gets told by his best friend and then he goes into a whole bunch of stuff about how you know everyone on the production crew is really sad and they enjoyed working with him and i'm sure i i never met him i'm sure he's a great guy but you screwed up when you pushed valve twice don't you piss got, off you, the you, boss man you like got your warning yeah, you could say whatever you want to. If you're best friends with your boss, though, you can get away with a lot more. But when you're the exact opposite, like too good, where you're, you were specifically brought in because somebody said you deserve to set. If you're already on your second chance, like don't don't push the envelope. Don't come in with a porn joke because that's what your fans expect. Guess what? If they're your fans, tell them, guys, I'm hosting this tournament as an employee of valve. So I'm going to respect what they want me to do. And, and it's not even, you're not on your YouTube channel. And it's it's not even something that he, he didn't know because in this 17 page statement, he goes, okay, it's history time and goes through every issue that he and valve have had together since TI two. So it's not like this is something that came out of the blue that he was surprised about. This is something that's been brewing for a long time and he gets removed and granted, apparently, you know, the, the Reddit crowd loves, loves this guy and thinks he's the best host to ever touch Dota 2, I suppose. Um, but when you're consistently told not to do something or you know there's an issue in the way you do something, you either change it or you get removed. Unfortunately, you picked the Shanghai major that had all these other issues going along with it that was probably enough to push Gabe Gabe over the edge to just say screw it and fire you and the production staff all at the same time. Sucks to suck. It's like you said, I'm sure he's a really nice guy. I've never met him either, but I mean, what you, you left him no choice. And then at this point, uh, Peter Dagger even tweeted today that rumor is the opening ceremony for the main event has just been straight out canceled. So we're just going into the main event, into the games, and crossing our fingers at every... Th- but, I mean, good news is there's only up from here. Like, it can't get any more worse than where where they're at right now. I mean, you've already fired a production crew and your host for the event. What else can you do? But that is... that the The sad part about all that is it's covering up actually good gameplay as well. Like, we just spent you know, 15, 20 minutes just talking about the drama going on behind the scenes. We didn't even bring up how Fnatic was playing really well or anything like that. So we'll, obviously that's what the main event's there for. I mean, we'll obviously talk about the gameplay there, but the discussion point for the entire first week of the event with everybody was not the gameplay. It was this mess going on behind the scenes between almost three different parties that was, you know, just out in the open. But moving on, moving on to the micro, we have a few things here before we wrap up the show. Uh, What what was your contribution this week to the micro? A very small one, actually. It was just recently announced that ESL and Intel have partnered to create the AnyKey organization uh, that you can find at anykey.org. Uh, which is a organization or group focused on inclusion in esports for uh, specifically listed females, LGBT, and people of color, I believe is the way they worded it. I would tell you exactly how they worded it, but the server is now down. It was up about six hours ago when I pulled the link, and now it does not work anymore. Maybe the initiative has already been... <laughs> it's just so... Yeah. was such a failure. They, they dropped it already. Six hours old. I have. Cloud9 actually takes the NA Spring Regional uh, with a 3-1 to win over uh, 
Navantic, Navantic, however you want to say it, and Heroes of the Storm, that was their NA Spring Regionals there. Uh, over the weekend, Cloud9 takes it. That's really all I got. It was actually a really good tournament. It was pulling. I even messaged you. It was pulling around 40,000 viewers on Twitch. Yeah, you did message me. Heroes of the yeah. Storm. So that's that's not bad. I, I don't know how much of that was based off of because Blizzard was offering like free portraits, in-game portraits, if you watched. But hey, however you got to get your viewers, get your viewers up because I honestly think it helped. I was starting to see a lot of people more on the Heroes of the Storm subreddit saying, hey, I'm new to the game. I just watched this tournament. You know, what do I what do I need to know? You have a lot of people who are moving over from. I'm going to say the less skilled players from League of Legends and Dota moving over from HOTS. And I could say that because I was one of those less skilled players that moved over from Dota. So don't feel bad. It's, it's an not, e- it's, it's an not, easier MMO or a MOBA. It's not nearly as hard. It's Man, okay. It's, it's enjoyable to play. It's awesome. It's fun with friends. Um, and then also, uh, I always got to bring it up. Street Fighter V had their first event for the Pro Capcom Pro League this weekend. Uh, Mister Crimson ended up taking that. So by default, that means he's first place right now in the world for Street Fighter after one tournament. So he he gets that title for winning the first tournament. The next one, though, is actually coming up here shortly. It's, it's the tournament's called Final Round, and that's actually March 18th through the 20th in Atlanta. They shouldn't do that. The final round on yeah, the, second the second tournament, tournament, and you're the final round. It's video game, man. It sounds like video games. People like final rounds. That's a, that any key organization. I was like, that's not, that's v- the only reason that's even loosely related to video games is because it's a key on the keyboard. <laughs> Like it says, press any key to log in or whatever. Oh, it, is that what that's on? Yeah, it's like I was any okay. key. It, it I was just actu- going with it. It doesn't even does not have any actual gaming connotation at all, other than it it has the logo is a keyboard key. Look, in a couple months, the E League is about to start, so Ugh. we've already decided. Ugh. Corporate America is not the greatest at starting up well, names. To be fair, they're like preteens naming their gaming clans. This is true. This is <laughs> we were true. all there. They'll grow up. I mean, our professional team is called Operation Minty Hippo. For Still awesome. Out loud. Still, Still the best awesome. team. Still awesome. Well, that will just about do it for us. I thank you so much for listening. If you made it this far, if you skipped around, episode 22 of the Center Ring is done and over with. We will be back next week, Monday or Tuesday or such. Who knows? We'll see if we deal with fighting traffic that night. Check us out on our website, tcr.gg. Like I said, you can catch all past episodes there. Uh, You can check out our YouTube, which has all our past episodes there, plus some visual effects. If you wanted to just catch interviews with some people around esports, we have GB James, coach of Team Liquid CSGO on there. Um, You could certainly check all that out on YouTube. But until then, you can always keep up with the show on Twitter at The Center Ring. I'm at Pirate Mushroom. Brandon is at Brand Any New. Yep. So check us out there. Let us know what you think of the show. Until then, we will see you next week for episode 23 of The Center Ring, where we discuss probably Katowice. We will discuss shanghai major and whatever drama happens to pop up because you know it's gonna be there it's it's a week long until our next show in esports always a lot of drama (laughs) so again i thank you for listening uh to the center ring and we will see you next time drive safe